all kinds of things can be used to achieve the goal. And I think Absolutely. often we have quite a limited view of, particularly with fitness, we see it as being something that you have to do for a block of time in Lycra and you have to be sweating <laughs> and it's got yeah. to be uncomfortable or you're not making progress. So welcome to this episode of Finding Your Range podcast with me, Jeannie Debon. This is the podcast that looks into hypermobility, chronic pain, and EDS. So I'm joined today by um, an occupational therapist. You may, you may recognize her because she's very well known in the hypermobile community, um, Jo Southall. So welcome, Jo. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. I'm really looking forward to this. Um, I always learn so much from these interviews, so I'm looking forward to learning more about what you do. So let me just read you um, Joe's bio before we get into the questions. So Joe is an independent occupational therapist, an expert patient with many years experience self-managing complex health conditions. She lives with hypermobile EDS, postural tachycardia and visual stress. Her own lived experiences combined with OT theory form the basis for her online practice. She volunteers for the Hypermobility Syndromes Association or the HMSA as you might know it. And she's also on their medical advisory board. Uh, regular OT work is mostly one-to-one -one appointments with clients and their loved ones. And she is a regular guest lecturer and she leads webinars and training sessions both in the UK and abroad. And Joe recently started down the practice educator route, which we were just talking about just before we came online. Um, and that's really amazing. We'll touch on that as well, Joe, so people know, because there might be people listening who'd love to do what you're offering, actually. So that's really cool. So very, very welcome. And thank you for joining us. So thank you. We're going to get straight into the questions. And I always like to start with this one. Um, uh, your personal journey, because obviously you have um, HEDS as well and visual stress and postural tachycardia. So could you tell us a little bit about your journey, your personal journey and how these conditions have impacted your life? Yeah, so it's, it's a bit of a long and winding journey. My original kind of passion in life was outdoor adventure so I was a rock climbing instructor I went kayaking did high ropes wow. did all, all the really exciting stuff and I was injured pretty much constantly <laughs> and everyone pretty much put this down to me choosing dangerous hobbies because you know climbing wall equals injury obviously except that nobody else in the club was injured it was just me um uh, yeah I'd had kind of intermittent periods of really severe hip problems as a kid I had the classic growing pains yeah. um, really quite severely as a young child mum had many sleepless nights sat by my bedside trying to get me to sleep um, and then about a week before my A-levels were due to start I fell off the asymmetric bars at gymnastics <gasps> and dislocated my radius and ulnar in my left arm in opposite directions oh my gosh without a fracture which greatly puzzled pretty much everyone in A&E because that's not really supposed that's not how it's supposed <laughs> to work do you know um so after a couple of weeks a lot of weeks um we had like a removable plaster cast because it was my dominant hand as well so um I had to be able to take the plaster cast off and rest my arm on an ice pack so I could write for my A-levels um but I never really got full range of motion back so I was I referred myself to physio and I was like, oh, you know, I, the strength is back pretty well. You know, I, the pains reduce greatly, but I just haven't got a full range of motion. And I put my arm out straight and they went, well, that is full range of motion. What more do you want? <laughs> and I was like, oh, well, the other one goes backwards. So I was kind of hoping to get back to normal. And they went, right, what we need to do is seize the rest of your body up to match your bad elbow. And I was like, OK. <laughs> um, so having gone in for an elbow problem, I sat there with this physio who was like, hmm, I'm a little bit suspicious of your kind of past injury history. Um, so she got me stripped down to my pants and we went through the baiting criteria and did all the stretches. And she was like, I think you seriously need to go home. Google hypermobility syndromes and speak to your GP this week. So I did. Wow. And I went to my GP who um, kind of looked at me and went, isn't that just being like a bit bendy? And I was like, well, that's what I thought. But it turns out I was really you know wrong like it's a lot more complicated yes um, 
my GP, and this this is like a turning moment, and I still highlight this when I talk about like best practice, said, mm. okay, what I want you to do is go home and come back in two weeks. And I said, okay. And we were both going to go and do our independent research and see what needed to happen. So mm. two weeks later, I came back and said, I think I want to try X, Y, Z and be referred to these places. And my GP went, good, that's what I found as well. Ah, so we started excellent. the anti-inflammatories. We started the amitriptyline. And I got a referral sent to UCLH to their hypermobility clinic and a physio re-referral. Um, and we just got started down this road of kind of getting everything sorted. Yeah. Um, turns out going off to university, um, and radically changing your diet, lifestyle, habits, hobbies, interests, and <laughs> medications all at the same time <laughs> was a recipe for disaster. Yeah. Um, and I very quickly started having kind of more complicated joint problems. Mm. I persevered with the outdoor adventure, but in a very kind of highly adapted way, struggled through, kept going. Um, and then by the time I was 21, um, I got my first wheelchair. Um, just for part-time use for longer journeys supermarket yeah. trips that kind of thing um and then that was the same time I kind of realized that being 40 foot up a tree was not conducive to a long-term career strategy yeah. um so I started yeah. retraining as an OT and five years ah. later here I am um you know qualified went straight into independent practice and kind of moved on from there but yeah I'm wow. very very grateful for my GP just because that was a massive kind of yeah without Gosh. that things could have turned out very very differently yeah that's awesome isn't it because we hear so many stories of where the yeah. exact opposite happens and we're told to go home and not come back because there's Absolutely. nothing, nothing yeah. wrong with you oh yeah brilliant so um i'll just jump to um a further question because you mentioned it so all of this that was happening to you that did impact your choice in degree then you decided Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mum was a big one for this, actually, because I was kind of looking at, oh, maybe I should retrain. Maybe I should go to university and do something slightly less kind of energetic, yeah. should we say? Um, and I'd, I'd seen a really good hand therapist at the time and got talking about what he did for his job and how he liked yeah. it and that kind of thing. Um, and mum was like, well, why don't you retrain as an OT? And I kind of brushed it off and went, oh, no, I haven't got the haven't got the UCAS points. I haven't got the kind of I'm not smart enough for that, blah, blah, blah. And actually properly looked into it and I was only 10 credits short so I just did like an open university course and that was it yeah. I was in so um yeah like absolutely loved it and it's 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 not where I thought I would be when I started like the teenage kind of outdoor adventure journey but yeah um I start my master's next month so um it's it's definitely like I'm really glad this is where I ended up for yeah sure. Oh, that's amazing. So you're so you're doing a master's in is it an OT? Just it is, in, yeah. yeah. Oh, amazing. Oh, that's exciting. Really it exciting. Is, yeah. yeah, well done. Um, and can I just ask, what is visual stress and how does that affect you? So um visual stress, often known as kind of Erlen syndrome or scotopic sensitivity, is it's often seen as kind of a learning difference or kind of an educational challenge for a lot of people similarly mm. to kind of the dyslexia sort of thing right. um so a lot of people will have difficulty reading and writing they'll have difficulty with um you know struggling with like um certain colors on certain backgrounds um for me the reading and writing is mostly kind of i'm all right with that i get by particularly mm -hmm. with the tinted lenses um my main problems are kind of light dark adaptation um, so I'm kind of functionally night blind in the sense that I can see, but there's mm. so much kind of static over my vision and glare off light sources and flickeriness that like my brain can't make heads or tails of what that visual input is. So, um, wow. yeah, I basically kind of really struggle with things like depth perception with, if I look at a light source, there'll be like a massive starburst effect off it. Yeah. Um, so like I can't drive because headlights from oncoming vehicles are just too dazzling. Um, yes. If I come out of a tunnel, I can't see for 30 seconds afterwards, which is obviously, you know, a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so the, the lack of depth perception and being effectively night blind is, is the main kind of challenge for me. But a lot of people find that um, migraines or headaches are a problem. Um, yeah. Looking at repeating patterns, so pinstripes or geometric mm. grids, anything oh, yes. like that. Yes. Um, but it, it's, it's interesting because I've 
since get, I had this diagnosed when I was like 12. So this was long before the hypermobility stuff mm. became a problem. Um, but I have since met quite a lot of people on the hypermobility spectrum that also have yeah. very similar issues. So yes, um, yeah. I was going to yeah. ask you, is it, is it, you know, connected to the EDS? I, yeah, this is one of those things, very much like the whole kind of autism connection, where we yes. see a lot of correlation, but we haven't yes. conclusively proved a causation. Yes. Um, so yeah. since working with me, my optometrist then started asking her other visual stress clients if they got travel sick, if they had hypermobile joints, if they had back pain, that kind of thing. Mm. And a really interestingly high percentage of them said, yes, they were double jointed. Wow. Um, so she kind of told me that and I was like oh that's really interesting yeah you know, like there is kind of a weird yeah link there somewhere but we don't yes. know to what extent it's just the fact that both of these things are fairly common or is it that actually yeah. one causes the other so, yeah mm. interesting very interesting um so let's move on to what you're doing now which you clearly love what you're doing mm -hmm. which is fantastic and helping so many other people along the way um could you, in very simple terms, what is occupational therapy? So occupational therapy is all about doing things. Um, it, in my mind, I kind of separate into two things. So we know there are kind of health benefits, therapeutic benefits um, to activity, to fresh air, to walking, to Tai Chi, to yoga. We've mm -hmm. scientifically proven that doing these things is good for you in more than just a physically getting fit way. It's good yeah. for your brain. It's good for your emotional state. Yeah. And then there's the kind of, I want to do this thing, but my body or my mind are preventing me from doing it to my satisfaction. Yeah. So then we would come in and go, okay, well, this is what we want to achieve. Do we need to look at adaptive strategies do we need to look at equipment do we need to delegate some things out do we need to put you in a different environment in order to achieve it um so right. it's kind of like a an interesting split really between like enabling people to do things and doing things to enable good health basically so um hmm. occupation isn't just your job occupation yeah. is your hobbies your interests your family relationships you know okay. the things that you do that just bring you joy yes so, yeah. Oh, ah, so somebody would come to see you, um, a new client, say, and you'd look at what they're doing now, maybe what they want to do. Yeah. And then you would say, OK, what can we do to help you achieve this? What yeah. tools do you need? What strategies do you need? Yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. Absolutely. But equally, it may be that somebody will come to me and say that I am really deconditioned. I'm really struggling to get fit, but I'm not mm. kind of enthused by any of the options available. Yeah. Um, so we might then look at things like, actually, let's find a hobby that interests you and we can use that to get you fit. Yes. So gardening can be used for fitness. Dance can be used for fitness. Yes. Yeah. Um, do you know, playing a musical instrument to a certain extent builds muscle in various areas. So all kinds of things can be used to achieve the goal. And I think often we have quite a limited view of, particularly with fitness, we see it as being something that you have to do for a block of time in Lycra and you have to be sweating <laughs> and it's got yeah. to be uncomfortable or you're not making progress. But yeah. actually, you know, 20 seconds of um, fitness work while the kettle boils, yeah. if you do that four times a day, yeah. that's fitness it's adding up so yeah Absolutely. it's that, that creative thinking approach is what I really like about the job yeah I'm totally with you on that I always say to my clients and my you know online um, Zebra Club members you know it doesn't have to be on a mat doing you know Absolutely. whatever crunches and bridges and, and um, you know going for a walk going to whatever it doesn't have to be like you say doing something you know while you're boiling a kettle heel raises knee lifts it all counts. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Definitely. We definitely want to change that whole approach to exercise as it sort of is thrown at us by the media, right? But Completely. And this is why I send so many people your way, because you know, <laughs> we think the same way here. And I think it's the best way to do it. Yeah, it's, it's much healthier, you know, because for us, it's so challenging, right? For so many of our clients, um, the last thing we want to do is put hurdles in people's way, right? Absolutely. So, if, if something is too hard, if it's painful, if exhausting, you yeah. won't do it long term. You just no. won't. No. You know? And we need long term change because we've got long term conditions. So. Exactly. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So um, we've touched on it a little bit. But so if someone who has got hypermobility comes to see you, um, 
Do most of your clients have high mobility, by the way, or do you see all sorts of people? I see all sorts, but there's a decent percentage of hypermobility. I think simply because I'm quite open about my own medical history online. Yeah. And yeah. because I do a lot of kind of affiliated stuff with the HMSA, yeah. um, I'm just more well known in that circle. Yeah. Recently, yes. I've been seeing quite a lot of long COVID. Um, mm. I have always had quite a lot of kind of chronic fatigue syndromes, MEs, post viral yeah. fatigue type stuff. Um, yes. So I do see a lot of conditions, but there is often a hypermobility element squeezed yeah. in there somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so so somebody with hypermobility comes to see you. What practical ways could occupational therapy be helping them? So typically I'll start with a load of paperwork that just breaks down all the things in your life that are not as easy as they could be. And we'll yeah. kind of prioritise from there. Um, so a lot of what I do is around lifestyle adaptation. So pacing and fatigue management are massive. And pacing is also really, really useful for things like pain management, um, anxiety, feeling emo- mm. like kind of emotionally overwhelmed. All of these yep. things, pacing can be really, really useful. So yep. that's almost always my starting point is let's look at getting you less exhausted consistently and then we can do bigger changes. Yes. Um, I really dislike the way a lot of healthcare advice is given out where it expects you to stop doing hobbies or interests so you can spend more time on rehab and Mm. I'm just not a fan so I would much rather say okay we're going to make this really teeny tiny little change with regards to your energy usage so you are less exhausted and then that spare energy that's what we put towards rehab yeah nice so that's kind of my that and the fact that pacing is actually really really difficult so um the sooner you start the easier it is to kind of we can touch on it in the next session and the one after that if we need to yeah I typically also look at things like um sleep hygiene and kind of joint protection and injury management so the way we're moving the way we are carrying out everyday tasks um I talk to my clients about sport mode quite a lot so particularly for the high mobility community when people are exercising they perceive that as being a dangerous activity it's like risky to exercise. So you put yourself on this kind of heightened level of awareness Mm -hmm. where you're body aware, where you listen to the signals your body gives you, where you pay attention to your posture in order to exercise safely. But that's not a sustainable kind of place to be in. So we Mm -hmm. do that for sport and then we sit down and then we injure ourselves reaching for a drink or getting out of a cardigan. Yeah. So a lot of yeah. um, the kind of injury prevention and injury management stuff is around actually how can we make you more body aware? How can you start to listen to what your body is telling you? Because yeah. typically chronic pain makes you very, very, very good at ignoring what your body tries to tell you because yeah. everything it tells you is unpleasant. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) So you shut down, you just stop paying attention. And we actually have to reconnect in order to make it safe for you to start doing new things and learning how far you can walk, how far, how long you can sit for, how far you can reach safely. You have to have that level of body awareness or you're just going to get injured constantly. Um, So that's typically the kind of starting point. And we'll then move on to actually if you've got the pacing in order and you've got your injury rate down significantly and a lot of that chronic pain has kind of calmed down a little bit and your stress levels are lower yeah what is left that's still really difficult and often that will be a much much shorter more specific list of challenges than at the start where somebody will come in and go i don't know what to do everything's too hard i don't have enough energy um so we'll then look at okay maybe would a mobility aid be useful for this specific scenario yeah. Or would it be useful to have a different kitchen gadget or can you buy pre-chopped veg so that you can make food from scratch, but without exhausting yourself? Yeah. And it's those kind of extra adaptations. And then you all start to put it together and you write it all up and you go to your GP and your doctor and your best friend and your family and your partner. And you say, this is how we're doing things from now on. <laughs> Ta-da. And yeah. then everyone works from the same plan. And you get something that vaguely resembles cohesive symptom management across the board. Yeah, Um, I love that. I love this (laughs) approach. It's really lovely. And it's also, I think, you know, like you say, having everyone, A, not the person not feeling bad about maybe having to use special tools or having to buy chopped veg or, and also the family, the friends accepting that. It's so important, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, completely. 
yeah. yeah. And I think often we we limit our ways of thinking. So, and and I know this. I you know when I went to my first ever HMSA event, this was the thing I took away from it that you don't have to use a mobility aid all the time, mm. and you don't have to use it in the way that it's designed to be used. So, yeah. in my mind, when when I was younger, when you became a wheelchair user, that was it. You sit down for the rest of your life. It wasn't an option that I could actually go, okay, you know what? If I go to the corner shop in my wheelchair, it saves me a bit of energy so I can get some gardening done when I get home. Mm. Or yeah. if I'm going to the shops on my own, I can wheel myself there and then I can load my wheelchair up with my shopping and I can push it home like a trolley whilst using it as a walking frame. Mm. It, you're yeah. allowed to do that and it works really well, but people don't talk about the fact that you're allowed to do that very often. Yeah. So, yeah. No, it's really good. It's giving people freedom, isn't it? Freedom to adapt to what they need. I love that. And I love what you're saying about, you're, you're absolutely right. You know, we, we pay attention to all these things when we're exercising, but then as soon as the class finishes, it's like, oh, we go back to our up postures. And yep. that's, I, that's one thing I really focus on is helping build sensory awareness so people can, cap, you know, for me, exercise isn't just what you do in that class. People carry it on to their everyday life. And that's when it becomes really valuable, right? Yeah, spot um, on. Yeah, completely yeah. agree. Lovely. That's great. So we touched on this uh, flare up. So I know, yeah, flare up, you have flare up planning sessions um, that you do with people. Yeah. So flare ups are obviously a huge thing, right? They happen. They're so unpredictable. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, how can we manage those? What goes on in a planning session? So the first thing I'm going to say is that flare ups happen to everyone, regardless yep. of how good you are at symptom management. So I teach symptom management for a living every once in a while, despite the fact that this is literally my day job, my body <laughs> will floor me for no conceivable reason. It just happens. It is not anyone's fault. Bad luck. The end. Yeah. Um, flare up planning is around making sure you've got a plan in place for when that happens so that it doesn't completely monopolize 100% of your life and you're left struggling to communicate your needs. Yeah. What I found certainly in my own experience, but also with pretty much all of my clients, is that when you need help in a kind of flare-up or emergency situation is the time you are least capable of requesting that help. Mm. Yeah, good point. Mm. So flare-up planning is about having something in place so that those around you, your medical team, your healthcare support, whoever, knows what to do when you can't communicate that. Yeah. Particularly yeah. from a POTS perspective, a lot of us have difficulty in POTS flares with verbal communication as well. So yeah. um, I'll think one word and something completely different will come out and then I'll get really angry that nobody's listening to me. But it's because yeah. I'm talking rubbish and nobody knows what <laughs> I'm on about. Um, so having that flare up plan means that I can just go do these things, please. And they can just look across and it goes POTS flare up, steps one to ten. And it's things like crisps, drink, rehydration sachets, check I've actually had my medication, compression stocking, wow. cooling oh. vest. So anyone I can give it to, anyone that has a copy of that, knows what support I need in the order in which I need it and the way I'd like it done. Wow, that's amazing. What a great idea. And it, yeah. Like, yeah. Brilliant. Thanks. Um, but yeah, so, you know, I, I really love doing these because it's just such a good kind of brain fog buster, if nothing else, because yeah. so many of us were found um, heat intolerance is a key one. If you're mm. feeling unwell because you're kind of overheating, your brain doesn't process what you need to do very well at all. Um, mm. So I remember having a discussion with a friend of mine who's got quite severe heat intolerance and they'll go, oh, I don't feel very well, so I'll tuck myself under a blanket or put a snuggly jumper on. But that's the exact opposite of what you need to do. Um, so having a flare-up plan that goes, okay, actually, if you feel a bit rough in these ways, these are the things you need to do. Even yeah. if you haven't got anyone else involved in your support network, it's really useful. Yeah. The other thing I really like about it is that if you give a copy to your GP, when you get one of those problems where you go, mm, I can sort of manage this, but it's not actually getting any better, and you go to your GP, they yeah. don't spend half an hour telling you stuff you've already tried. <laughs> yeah. Because they know that in the event of you ending up in a doctor's appointment with XYZ symptoms, these are the things you've already tried at home. 
mm-hmm. meaning that you can skip the whole, have you tried drinking more? Do you take paracetamol? Would you like to wait two weeks and see if it goes away discussion and get yeah. straight on to useful things like maybe we should refer you or try this medication or have you right. spoken to a therapist? Yeah. And it just kind of speeds up that whole process. Yeah. It's a great way of helping people advocate for themselves as well, isn't it? Yeah. So that they're, right. actually, they're in charge of their doctor's appointments rather than just getting brushed off. That's great. I love that idea. So simple as well. And you can, what a great idea. Everyone should have one of those. Absolutely. They? Yeah. Yeah. And I love the fact that, you know, it's very reassuring to hear that when the professional says that, you know, you get flare ups too and it doesn't matter. Sometimes Absolutely. it just yeah. happens. It's yeah. really reassuring, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Now, your name came up actually in, um, it was a real coincidence actually today. Somebody in my Zebra Club forum, was asking for help with chronic fatigue and okay. um, they were really struggling and someone said oh you need to go and look at joe southall's website because she's got all the and i was like oh i'm talking to her today so there you go someone Fantastic. was listening so i love it so yes chronic fatigue fatigue um how can we what can we do to help ourselves with fatigue Fatigue management is one of my favourite topics to talk about. And I could fill this entire recording, this whole episode, (laughs) just talking about pacing. and fatigue. Um, I think fatigue management in general is taught very, very badly. We're taught, do a thing, have a rest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, And I have massive issues with that, particularly for the chronic pain community, because having a rest is always thought of as being lay down and do nothing for 20 minutes. Mm. Yeah. But actually, distraction is a fantastic pain management strategy. So if you remove all of your distractions, what you're left with is, wow, everything hurts quite a lot when I pay attention to it. (laughs) (laughs) That's a good point. (laughs) So there are kind of two key strategies I teach with regards to pacing. The first one is activity alternating, and it's all about swap, don't stop. So I try to break my life into three categories. So the first one is the kind of physically challenging stuff. So that's my physiotherapy, gardening, dancing, um, scrubbing out the hedgehog cotches because I do hedgehog rehab for fun. Um, (laughs) Yeah. Um, Wiping down the windows, you know, cleaning the worktops, all the stuff where you're kind of making your body work quite hard. Bed sheets, changing bed Mm. sheets is a key one for so many Mm. people. Yeah. Then you've got your cognitive stuff. And often we don't appreciate how exhausting it is thinking about things. Mm -hmm. Um, or talking about things or doing academic work Um, online shopping banking anything with money you concentrate that a little bit harder and it does make it exhausting Mm -hmm. Um, and then you've got your kind of relaxation activities and these tend to be the things that we sacrifice first when there aren't enough hours in the day and I think that's really really upsetting and really sad yeah Um, so you can use relaxing activities physical activities whatever you need to do to kind of pace other stuff So this is a cognitively challenging event. We are doing a Mm -hmm. recording. There's a lot of thinking on the spot. There's a lot of talking. Yeah. After this, rather than going to lay down for a little while, I'll go and do something that's physically challenging, but doesn't require complex thought. So something like loading the dishwasher or wiping crumbs off the worktops. Mm -hmm. Right. What that does is give my brain a rest. It gives my eyes a rest. I can stop talking for a little while. But what I get to do is get rid of some of that muscle tension I've got from sitting for too long, get my circulation going again, get my digestion working again um, and get that kind of from a POTS management perspective, regular little bits of movement are really useful. So I kind of get myself physically going whilst having a sort of cognitive break. So alternating, yeah. If you alternate between tasks that are challenging in very different ways, you can rest bits of yourself without having to lay down on a couch and do nothing. Right. Oh, I've never heard of that before. That's really interesting. This is my um, issue with a lot of the fitness industry because you'll get like leg day. That's the oh complete God. opposite. Do you know, it's awful. No, no um, I hate that. I hate that as well. Yeah. Absolutely. If you've got a very leg focused exercise and your legs get a little bit towards the end of their limit, you know? There's no reason why you can't sit comfortably and do some hand therapy exercises or read a book or catch up on some academic reading. It's I really like the idea of just going, Okay, my brain needs a break. So I'll work on my legs or my legs are done. I'm going to do something that I really enjoy now. 
So you will get times where you need to just lay down, but it can mm-hmm. be laying down with an audio book. I yeah. have learned to knit laying down. I um, very deliberately learn to do craft activities with my feet up or sitting or standing so that I can kind of alternate between different positions. Mm. Um, and it just gives you that ability to be a bit more flexible with how you're doing things and when you're doing them. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. What about when you have those, sometimes it happens to me, like after I've, you know, been concentrating a lot, it is the uh, mental fatigue actually that gets me not yeah. physical fatigue. Um, but I get this sort of brain foggy, like I feel like I've got jet lag and all I want to do is actually lie down and you know, sleep. Um, so when you feel like that, is it okay to go and lie down and just sleep? Absolutely, yeah. And particularly for people with kind of really severe fatigue symptoms, you're mm. going to need to do more horizontal stuff than vertical stuff. Yeah. yeah. Sleep, by all means. Um, if you're going to have a nap, 90 minutes is about the average you should be aiming for because that's a full sleep-wake kind of REM sleep, light sleep cycle. Yeah. So you're going okay. to sleep, getting the full benefit of a nap, and then you're waking up at the lightest part of your sleep cycle. Whereas right. if you have a 20 minute nap, your alarm yanks you out of REM sleep mm. with all the grace of a landmine going off <laughs> and you yeah. wake up going, oh, what day is it? Where am I? Oh, I feel horrible. Yes. Um, which, you know, So you kind of don't get any benefit from it. But likewise, you don't need to do equal amounts of each activity. So you can do 30 seconds of exercise and then an hour of watching TV with your feet up. Mm. But you're still yeah. alternating. Yeah. 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 Makes, makes sense. Yeah. yeah I like it. Oh. The Great. other strategy I really like is the micro break. So all we're talking about are like 10 to 30 seconds of not doing the thing you're currently doing. Right. Um, so there's a lot of kind of dead time with activities where we watch the activity occurring, but our concentration isn't actually essential to it. Yeah. So what I used to do when I was sending emails was press send, watch the taskbar sync and then immediately click on the next thing. Now I'll press send, stop, have a little bit of a stretch, get my shoulders moving, move my neck around, have a sip of drink and then I'll go back to work. In those micro breaks, I very deliberately kind of do a head to toe body scan and just go, okay, how am I feeling? Mm -hmm. Are my arms and legs attached? Have I got pins and needles from sitting badly? What's the back pain like? Am I hungry? Did I skip my last round of medication? When was the last time I had a vegetable? All of those (laughs) kind of useful self-care things. So when you find something and you go, you know what, I've got a little bit of a niggly headache, stop and deal with it. But Mm -hmm. we don't notice these things unless we have these micro break check ins Mm. because we've got so good at ignoring everything. Yeah, very. Yeah. Yeah. Really true. If you've got a little bit of a niggly headache, Mm. 15 minutes away from your computer and a cup of tea, maybe a bit of fresh air, good to go again. Yeah. If you ignore a headache for 15 minutes and then another three hours after that, um, what you end up with is painkillers and darkened room. Because you've let the symptoms get so bad that you then have to completely step away in order to recover. Yes. So the more proactive you are with fatigue management and symptom management in general, the easier it is to manage. Amazing. I'm honestly, I'm nodding my head there because I'm so guilty of that. Those little headaches that I can feel, and then I go, "Oh, I'll just do a bit more." And like you say, three hours later, I've got a splitting headache, and I can't do anything. <laughs> so it's a absolutely complete, yeah. complete waste of time. Yeah. <laughs> no, I really, I'm going to honestly, I'm going to be changing some of my things after after Fantastic. today. Yeah, Thank, uh, really. excellent. Now, you mentioned that um, you have a um, wheelchair. You're mm-hmm. you sometimes use a wheelchair. Um, What's your experience been, sort of good and bad? Because obviously it's not always easy, is it, getting around in a wheelchair? And, no, you know, so um, I know, so I'd like to hear what your experiences have been as a user. Um, and then I know on your website, you do have this lovely beginner's guide to using yeah. a wheelchair. So you can, if you could tell us a little bit about that as well. Absolutely. So I think my, my general approach for mobility aids in general is that, If you've got very variable mobility, you need to have a couple of different options in order to be able to meet your needs the majority of the time. Yeah. So 
if you are mostly okay with a walking stick, so that's all you have, when you end up with a leg injury, and injuries happen, it's a part of the condition, you know, we learn to manage. Yeah. If you end up with an injury that means you need to be non-weight bearing, you're then stuck and you can't do anything until you either get a mobility aid or the injury recovers. Mm -hmm. Having a wheelchair allows me to go out and do things, to get to the shops, to go on social events, to um, basically engage with the world, regardless of whether or not I'm capable of walking. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. about giving myself options. Um, so I've got um, a wheelchair. I've got power assist wheels built into it to make it easier to push. I've got um, crutches, two sets of crutches, different kinds. I've got um, folding walking sticks, left and right handed. You know, I've got all the different options so that almost all of the time, regardless of how uncooperative my body is feeling, I can leave the house and I can go and do things and I can get to university and I can go to conferences. Yeah, yeah. Because I've got options. Yes, yes. <laughs> that said I recently had a really horrendous shoulder injury that meant I couldn't self-propel and I found myself back in the situation where I was like trapped in the house going oh this is really inconvenient maybe I need a power chair as well just in case I get really horrible shoulder injuries again um right. but yeah so it, it, it is a kind of learning process where you kind of adapt or buy the next thing or try stuff yeah. and then you chop and change as you need it but yeah yeah the first time I ever went to the supermarket in a wheelchair I got halfway through the kind of the shop and was just like, is this what shopping is supposed to feel like? Because I'd never understood how anyone enjoyed shopping as a hobby. <laughs> and then I got around the shop and I was like, you know what? If this is what it feels like for other people to go shopping, I can see why people enjoy it. Yeah. Um, and it was a real revelation that I didn't have to be exhausted and on the verge of passing out by the time I got to the checkout. Yeah. I just, it, yeah, blew my Gosh. mind. This was just like yeah. a new concept to me. Um, and I think it is kind of groundbreaking in some ways that when we find something that means we suffer less, we go, wow, I didn't know it was an option to like not feel horrible whilst doing this. Yes. But, yeah. Um, yeah, it, it, it's given me my independence. I leave the house on my yeah. own. I don't have anyone with me. I don't worry about that. I'm not concerned about falling over in the shops. It, yeah. It's given me my confidence to be on my own. Yeah. Um, regardless of how uncooperative my body is feeling. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It is. It has been a game changer. Yeah. That said, I try to be quite flexible with my use of my wheelchair, partly because it helps educate the public. So, again, there's this perception that once you sit down, that's it. We're all paraplegics. Nobody who uses a wheelchair can walk. But actually, the, the majority of wheelchair users can stand unaided. Yeah. Okay. So there's a lot more of us out there that can get up and walk, but often don't have the confidence to do it. So I'll quite often use a wheelchair to get to a location as an ex you know, on university campuses. Um, my plan is to use my chair to get to the right building and then I will park up and wander around the classroom quite happily. Mm. Yeah. Um, you know, so if I go to the pub with friends, I'll park at the table, but then I'll walk to the bar. Yes. So it gives me a comfortable seat and it gives me the ability to get around outside, but I don't need it inside the building so much. So yeah. um, it's, it is giving me those options. But I think that that, again, wasn't something that was talked about. I didn't know it was OK to do that. Yeah. Um, so the beginner's guide was aimed at kind of demystifying a lot of this. And like if you are thinking that actually this is the mobility aid for you, but you don't know what any of the keywords mean, how on yeah. earth do you find the information you need online? Yeah. So yeah. it, it was about kind of that bridging the gap between people that know all this already and people that don't even know where to start, because yeah. often it is just it, there is a chasm between what you want to know and knowing how to search for it. Yeah, of how course. to get that information. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Like you say, it's it's probably changing the public perception is quite a big thing, isn't it? Because probably people think, oh, you know, she doesn't need a wheelchair. She, yeah. she, she can walk around. It's, it's difficult, isn't it? People yeah, and the be... analogy, you know, it's the same as using a car. If you can walk, yeah. why do you drive to the supermarket? Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Because exactly. it's easier, right? <laughs> because yeah. you can't walk that far, because you can't walk that far and carry stuff. Yeah, you know? that's a really good point, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. yeah, thank you. So how do people get referred to OT? Is this, um, yours is a private practice, right? <laughs> yeah. So, but... 
but it's also available on the NHS, I guess. Yep, well. OTs are everywhere these days. Um, we are one of those professions that pops up when you least expect it. There are OTs in primary schools, there are OTs in oh. prisons, there are OTs in education settings, there are OTs um, in sports centres. I know OTs that work for the Red Cross. So, you know, we're everywhere um, right. doing all kinds of different things in different yeah. places, which I love. I think it's really exciting. Um, yes. mostly what you will find in a healthcare setting is either in places like pain management clinics there's often an OT yeah. in there um, or there will be OTs in like rheumatology and outpatient type settings um, or there's the social services option where an OT will come to your house and have a look around and go oh brilliant I see you struggle with stairs let's put something mm. in place to make that easier or yeah. I notice you can't get out of the bath let's put something in place that to make that easier yeah um so, yeah, we are kind of all over the place. But if you speak to um, your GP, normally there's like a, a kind of self-referral line. So there's like a contact number for your area and you just ring up and say, these are the things I'm struggling with. And right. the community OT comes out to visit and sees what they can do. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. But other than that, the kind of specialist one would be like fatigue management clinics or pain management clinics mm -hmm. um, where you can go for specific advice on key symptom management. Right. OK. OK. Um, and what what should they expect? So if they're coming for their very first session, you know, might be a bit scary and a bit nervous about it. What should we expect? Absolutely. So the start of the process is often about just trying to work out what your actual needs are. Yeah. And, and how they can help. So um, OT is one of the few professions where when we leave university, we're equally well trained in physical and mental health. Most other professions are geared more towards one or the other, um, oh, okay. which I love. So um, if you find an OT in like a physical setting, you know, and you actually do mention things like anxiety, do mention things like low mood, because, there are, you know, the support we've got is kind of wider than the scope of our job often. Yeah. So, um, oh, you know, That's we can really have different things. But yeah. I would say be honest, be open and be prepared. So if you in a month running up to your appointment, every time something is a real struggle, write it down. And when you get to your first appointment, just go, you know what, I'm going to be really open. I'm going to put it on the table and just go, these are the 20,000 things that I currently find difficult. Yeah. It, that might be too much to tackle. Some of it might not be applicable. Some of it might be for a different department, but yeah, a lot of that will be really useful information. Yeah. Try to give examples of things like actually on a good day, these are the things I can do but there's the potential for X, Y, Z to go wrong. And on a bad day, here are the things I really struggle with. Lay out all the information and see what they say. Yeah. Quite often, um, it may be a mix of equipment and coping strategies. It may be advice on how to adapt things. So actually, you may not need um, assistive advices, like devices to get you out of the bath, if we look at different ways to get out of the bath first. Mm -hmm. So it's that combination approach of just whittling down like what's complicated, what isn't. Yeah. Gosh. But, um, yeah. Hopefully that's sort of helpful. <laughs> yeah. I was just thinking while you were speaking, you, you, you have quite such a wide spectrum, don't you? You have to know so many different things. It's, this is uh, what I love about private practice is that because I'm not in a specialist clinic as such, yeah. the range of questions I get asked on an average month is fantastic people yeah. come to me with really like niche requests or really broad ones like i have this condition i don't know what any of it means yeah um so it it's it fascinates me how applicable key strategies are to so many things yeah so pacing is brilliant um i've done pacing master classes for people with adhd chronic fatigue parts long covid um chronic pain people who are um recovering from kind of a really severe bout of depression and also kind of make that journey back to being mm. you know an outside person a slightly less daunting process yes. um so I, th but these key strategies are applicable to so many things and often a lot of ot it's not diagnosis based it's need based mm. yeah. so i equally work with people who don't have the diagnosis yet but do have a lot of symptoms that are yeah you know really interfering with their life so yes I won't ever look at a case and go ah you've got hypermobility spectrum disorder you must need a wheelchair because that's not true 
Yeah. I'll talk to somebody and they say, these are the things that I want to get better at. These are the things I can't do at all. Here's what I want advice on. Yeah. We'll muddle our way through. That's great. It's great. Really interesting. Really interesting. And every case is different, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So what services, we've talked a bit about sort of your different planning sessions, and but what services do you offer um, on a private basis? So um, three masterclass sessions, pacing, joint protection and sleep hygiene. Um, the reason I did these three as masterclasses is because I find myself repeating the same strategies time and time again. And if it's a semi-scripted service, I can do it cheaper than if I do it on the fly. Um, yeah. So kind of there's those services set aside and then everything, a lot of the other stuff falls into what I've kind of just named freestyle appointment, which is basically you purchase 30 minutes of my time and use it however you choose. So we can mm. talk about one challenge in massive amounts of detail or we can touch on 30 things and I'll rapid fire just give you a list of places to look up more information or products or whatever. Yeah. Um, so that, that generally works quite well for the majority of things, because a lot of people will have kind of three or four questions, but they'll be very, very different questions. Yes. You know? yeah. So it, it's nice to get that range. Yeah. And then yeah. there's the kind of flare up planning. Um, I also offer a personal shopping service, which oh, is geared towards, it's geared towards disability specifically. Um, so it's personal shopping in the sense that um, you could come to me and say, I can't open jars. I can't put like, I can't brush the back of my hair. Um, I can't put socks on. I can't tie shoelaces. Um, I really struggle to break cheese. And I'll go, okay, here's a product that meets your needs. Ah, that's fantastic. Things. That's amazing. I, yeah, I really, I don't do many of those, but I find them really interesting when I do just because the, the, the disability assistive tech aids kind of world has grown massively mm. in the last like 10 years particularly yes. um, yeah. but there's so much out there that if you don't know what the device is called before you look for it it's mm. very hard to find the thing that you need often yes so yeah yeah um yeah it was basically about streamlining that process and people just get like an itemized list of things i think will be useful and where to buy them from wow that's brilliant i love that you're so flexible with your approach that people can come with whatever they need um, particular help with that's brilliant thank you and so if people are listening and they're thinking oh I'd love to have a session um, with Joe, um, how can they reach out to you where can we find you um, so my website is jboccupationaltherapy.co.uk um, if you google my name you'll find me um, email social media I'm on Facebook and Twitter quite a lot on Instagram you can reach me um, through the HMSA, you can they'll sign post to me quite readily. Um, but yeah, I'll, if I send you some social media links, stick them in the yeah. end or something. But um, yeah, 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 yeah. Typically, it's just get in touch any way you can, and yeah. we'll see what we can do. Um, appointments are usually done via Microsoft Teams. You don't need a user account for that. You just click on the link I send you, and you'll go straight through to um, the lobby, and you just pop your name in and click go. And yeah, but yes um and then email and kind of social media follow-up type stuff so yeah um yeah typically it's all very kind of remote casual do it when you've got time and you're not half asleep kind of <laughs> stuff so um yeah. yeah generally works quite well for most people yeah so all your appointments are online aren't they not in all person. of them are online yeah yeah um yeah. Typically with kind of email follow up. So if we've had like an appointment where we've talked about me going, OK, these three things might be really useful. I'll also get emails for those three things linked over afterwards, yeah. you know, so yeah. you've got um, got that to follow up on. But yeah. yeah, brilliant. Wow. Amazing. Really, really good. I'm sure you're going to get lots of people now <laughs> getting in touch with you. Um, I hope so. <laughs> um, and I will put your website and everything on the bottom um, in the the sort of comment section um, on this video as well. So if you didn't catch any of that, I will, it will be written here as well. So um, fantastic. Well, I've learned lots and lots about um, OT. Um, really, really, really interesting. Um, just it's so wide, isn't it? I'm just amazed at how many different things you must be um, have knowledge about, really. It's like, yeah, I, yeah, I really... I love the challenge of just yeah. 
challenging myself to learn more every yeah. year I'll try and learn a new thing so yeah, yeah it's been brilliant and fantastic and good luck with your masters as well which you're thank you very on. much Cheers. fantastic <laughs> Well, thank you for joining us and thank you everyone for listening today. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, if you've got any questions, you can obviously contact Joe directly or you can um, leave a comment here and I'll make sure she gets it. So thank you again. And until next time, keep moving.